So today I'll be preaching from James 1, 19 through 27. Um, I'll give you a chance to go there on your phones or Bibles or whatever you use these days. And I'll find it myself. All right, I'm going to pray again, and then uh, I'll read the passage. God, thank you for your word. Um, God, thank you for the fact that you love us and that you give us the gospel. um, And that you love us enough to tell us hard things. Um, I pray that you speak through me, God, that you help um, people receive your word. I'm not saying anything wrong. <laughs> um, you just be with us in Jesus' name. Amen. So James 1, 19 through 27. Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks, at, he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no, who, being no hearer who forgets but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. So I'm going to start off with a quote that I think will be back there. I don't know. Um, A quote by Martin Luther. In a word, St. John's Gospel in his first epistle St. Paul's epistles, especially Romans, Galatians, and Ephesians, and St. Peter's first epistle are the books that show you Christ and teach you all that is necessary and salvatory for you to know, even if you were to never hear, see, sorry, even if you were never to see or hear any other book or doctrine. St. James' epistle is really an epistle of straw compared to the others, for it has nothing of the nature of the gospel about it. So we can see that James was not the big, I'm sorry, Martin Luther was not the biggest fan of James. Um, In fact, he, uh, so Martin Luther's big, like, doctrine, right, what we know him for is the doctrine of justification by faith. Basically, the fact that we're saved through God's grace alone, um, all it takes to save us is faith in Jesus. And he, Martin Luther looked at James and thought, man, all James talks about is just doing stuff. Um, He's not really focused on the gospel like these other books are. Um, I don't even think James should really be in the Bible. Um, But that's not what James is saying. Um, And I can see how looking at James, it's easy to think that. Even my passage is like, hey, do more things, guys. Don't just hear it, do it. And later we'll see that James is big on like faith without works is dead. And so it's passages like these or statements like these that can you know, at first glance um, of James can lead us to believe James is just kind of preaching a different thing than Paul was or Jesus was, but he wasn't. And we'll see why. So he starts off, Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. And so we can see that James is concerned, first and foremost, with righteousness. He points out these things, um, being slow to speak, um, quick to listen, slow to anger. Um, and he kind of gives these examples, examples of sins or things that do not please God. And he tells them, put those off. And notice that uh, James's answer to these things, being quick to anger or quick to speak, um, are not just like, practical advice. They're not like, hey, here's 10 steps to uh, control your anger, or here's how to actively listen, you know, make eye contact and nod, you know. It's like, no, if there's this sin in your life, 
And if you're really producing the unrighteousness of God, put away your filthiness, your wickedness, receive the word, and it's able to save your souls. So I feel like that's pretty clear, pretty consistent with the Bible. But then he goes on and adds kind of a footnote, this footnote of but, so coming off that, receive the implanted word, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But with the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hooer who forgets but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. Um, and so I, I can see how it's easy to read this. And I think when I first read this, it's easy to think James is just saying, hey, guys, you know, you're in Jesus. That's great. Um, the way to be a better Christian or a more pious Christian or the way to have right devotion to God is to do stuff. So if you're hearing the word and not doing it, start. And it's, it's kind of a terms of uh, being a better Christian or being not so good a Christian, but either way, you're in Christ. And I, I think that's kind of at first glance the way I saw it and the way that it's easier to see it that way. But I don't think that's what James is saying. Um, I think James, James is saying that if you look at your life and your actions aren't consistent with what the Bible teaches and what Jesus teaches, then you might not actually be a Christian at all. And I think that because of the language that James uses, the analogy he uses, and then his parallel to Jesus' teaching. First of all, the language he uses is, is kind of heavy. Be doers of the word and not hearers only. Deceiving yourself. It's, it's just right there, like, if you are just hearing the word, you're deceiving yourself. You're, you're lying to yourself. And then later in the passage, verse 26, if anyone thinks he's religious and doesn't bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religious religion is worthless. And it's just, it's just strong language that leads me to believe that, right? If Sean comes up to me, where's Sean? Sean is somewhere. Sean's back there. If Sean comes up to me and says, hey, Roman, I'm struggling with this sin or lying or not being patient with Aaron. She's waking me up at like 3 a.m. with like Whataburger pregnancy cravings. Like uh, I haven't been the best husband or any sin, right? If he comes to me and says, Roman, I'm struggling with this. Can you pray for me? My immediate reaction is not like, man, Sean, I kind of think your religion's worthless. <laughs> like stop deceiving yourself, man. Um, because that's not what I believe about Sean, right? I believe Sean does love Jesus, and uh, he has shortcomings just like anyone else. Um, but that's not what James does. James doesn't just say, hey, repent, um, or use light language. He says, your religion's worthless. You're deceiving yourself. And he, and he kind of goes on in this analogy, for if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks intently at his natural face in the mirror, for he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty and perseveres, being a hearer who forgets but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. And so, um, sorry, back to the religion part, just real quick. I know today we can have a negative connotation of the word religion, but uh, just a side note, religion here um, is like good faith, right? We can kind of have a contrast today, like, oh, you have religion or relationship with God. In this passage, they're one and the same. So, but going on to James's, going on to James's analogy, um, he talked about two people, two people that look into a mirror and look at the gospel. He talks about person A. Person A looks in the mirror. Uh, he has smudges on his face. His hair is messed up. He goes away. He doesn't really care, or he cares, but he he forgets what he saw and doesn't fix anything. He goes away looking all ratchet, right? Um, so he doesn't fix anything, and it's, it's, it's like he never even looked in the mirror at all. Like, what's the point of looking in the mirror if you're not going to fix it? But then we have person B. Person B looks into the law, looks into the gospel, um, and changes it, right? He fixes his hair. He cleans his face. He does whatever needs to be done, and what he sees in the gospel, what he sees in the mirror, compels him to act. And this is very similar to some of Jesus' teaching back in the Sermon on the Mount. 
So, um, if you don't know, Sermon on the Mount, super famous sermon by Jesus, maybe the most famous. Um, and Jesus goes through a long list of teachings. I'm not going to go through the whole thing because it's a whole other thing. But at the end, um, Jesus uses, says kind of the same thing. He says, through, through some analogies, through some parables, there we go, parables, uh, like, hey, there are going to be two times, two types of people, people who respond to my teaching and do it, and people who don't. And the language he uses suggests that the people who don't aren't coming with me into my kingdom. He even goes as far to say that people will come to him and say, hey, Jesus, you know, didn't I, what's the actual verse say? It says, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. And so kind of translating that today, people are going to go up to Jesus and say, hey, uh, didn't I volunteer for VBS or didn't I go to church every Sunday or didn't I come up here and preach? Didn't I do these things? And Jesus is going to say, uh, I, I never really knew you. Um, and more than that, we can see that they're kind of characterized by their disregard for Jesus' teaching. He doesn't say, I never knew you, uh, you know, you just, you were one of the unlucky ones. He says, I never knew you, you're departing from me. I could tell, you're a worker of lawlessness. You didn't, you disregarded my teaching. And so based on this, it's easy to look at the passage and say, well, I can kind of see what Martin Luther was talking about, right? It seems like James and maybe even Jesus are just kind of saying, well, you need to do a lot to get into heaven. You need to try really hard, be a good Christian, uh, witness whenever you can, whatever being a good Christian looks like to you. Um, but that's not what James is saying. James is saying that if you have, and Jesus is saying, is that if you have true faith, it's going to lead to action. That when you believe something, it will lead to action. Right? This is kind of a, a silly analogy, but I strongly believe to my core that gravity exists. And I strongly believe to my core that I can't fly. So I don't try to do those things, right? I don't jump off a cliff and, and, and think that. And it's, it's a dumb analogy, but like, it really shows that when you believe something, you kind of shape your life around it. And so I'm like super scared of heights, right? Like, because I believe I'm going to fall and get hurt. And so if I really believe Jesus is teaching, I really think I should follow it. All right? So faith leads to action. And I think Elizabeth, Elizabeth, Elizabeth Elliot says it better than I do. And let me find the quote because I do not have it memorized. She says, God does not make all the moves for us. He provides the means to discipline. Will discipline then save us? No. It is Christ who saves us. We need to be very clear about this. From the earliest days of Christianity, people have fallen into the error of thinking of discipline as the means to salvation. Salvation is a gift, purely a gift, forever a gift. It is grace and nothing else that obtains it for us. Discipline is not my claim on Christ, but the evidence of his claim on me. I was back there. Um, so again, good deeds, works, don't save us. They're just kind of the evidence of our faith. And then going on, James, oh shoot, I'm in Matthew now. <laughs> James mentions, uh, James says, if anyone thinks he is religious, and does not, does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. And so James kind of keeps hammering the same point again. He uses a little bit more practical advice now. He, he talks specifically about speech and your tongue and what you say. It can kind of tie into what he said earlier, being slow to speak, um, being slow to anger. Um, but James just gives practical advice and says, if you're saying one thing, if you're, this person right here is, actually thinks he's religious. He thinks, I'm good. I'm a Christian. 
Um, and James is saying, I can't control your tongue. I don't, I don't know if you are. And James is really big on speech. Um, you'll see later in the book that, you know, Dominique's going to preach on it later. Like, he, he's big on speech. So he's saying if these things aren't here, um, or if these things are here, you might not be a believer. And he goes on to say, um, give an example of good religion or what good faith does. Religion pure and undefiled is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction. So today it might mean visiting and caring for the marginalized, the destitute, the poor in our society, and giving love to those who need love, sharing the gospel with those who need it. And I want to point out, and to keep oneself unstained from the world, and I want to point out that James not only addresses our actions, I know a lot of this can be seem like it's focused on our actions, just our physical actions, but he also focuses on our heart. And so he says, yes, physically, go out and do, right? Go and visit physically these orphans and widows, but also keep yourself unstained from the world. And I think part of that can be physical, like keeping yourself unstained, maybe refraining from things or whatever. Um, but I think a lot of it has to do more with our intent and our desires and our heart. And so, and again, that Matt. Whoa. <laughs> that matches what Jesus says earlier. Earlier in that Sermon on the Mount where he says, if you do these things, you know, you're basically my disciples. He says things like, hey, you don't cheat on your wife or you don't cheat on your spouse, great. You should keep not cheating on your spouse. But if you lust after someone in the street, you're cheating in your heart. Or you don't murder people, great. You shouldn't murder people. But if you're angry with your brother, you're liable to judgment. Or if you give money, or you pray, great, but if you're doing it just so people can see you, you're, you're missing the mark. One second. Um, and then lastly, I know this wasn't a long message, but lastly, before I get to the application, um, I don't want to make it seem that James is calling us to perfection. If anyone in here, Christian or not, or whatever state they may be in, goes to the Bible and compares their life to the Bible, they will find ways they fall short, and they will find ways that they don't meet God's standard. And James's and my and God's intention is to not make any, um, any Christian doubt their place with God or doubt their relationship with God. And so the application for us today is just for us to examine ourselves and see if we are the people that James is trying to warn. Right? If we're the people James, James is trying to warn, and it's not a fun thing to do. It's not pleasant. It's not, it doesn't feel good to think that, oh, I'm, I'm in Christ, or I am a, I'm a believer, and then, but when I look at the Bible, it's actually saying I might not be. And it's not just James. It's, it's, it's throughout the Bible. He's called to examine himself. So just the application, I would say, examine yourself according to the Bible. And, and unfortunately, I can't give you a list of concrete, like, numbers that make you a Christian. I can't say, well, if you served enough, you know, ten times this week, you're in. Or if you, uh, on the other side, if you lied ten times this week, this week you're out, you know. I can't do that. Um, it doesn't really work like that. It's more about your overall characteristics and your habits. But I can say one thing. One thing is black and white in the Bible that makes you a Christian or not. And is it, do you, when you think of heaven or when you think of Jesus being with him, um, is Jesus your only hope, right? When you think of being with God, is, is all your hope centered on him and on the gospel? All right, one characteristic of these people that were begging Jesus to get in um, even before we get to the workers of lawlessness part, is the fact that what they're trying to use to get into heaven or to get into the kingdom of God is their resume, right? Is that to appeal to God, they're trying to say, look at all these things I did, though. When, in truth, if a real believer, if God made a mistake and accidentally judged a real believer and said, oh, you're not getting in, um, he won't make a mistake. But if he did, 
the real believer's plea would not be, look at all these things I did. The real believer's plea would be, but I trusted you, man. Like, I put all my eggs in that basket. I don't, I don't really have anything else. And so I think the first and most important step is, do you, does your salvation in your mind rest on Jesus' gospel? And so if you're here today and you're thinking, I am definitely one of the people James is warning, uh, I would encourage you to, yeah, go to people, talk to them, ask for prayer. But first of all, to go to God yourself and look at the gospel, the fact that Jesus came, he lived a perfect life, he died in your place, and he rose again. Right? He took all the punishment you deserve and says, I'll give you all the perfection that I earned. And he rose again and overcame anything that would hold you back from God. If you're here and you're doubtful, if you're unsure, and I know I've been in that place, if you're unsure, I don't know if I'm kind of like, feel like I'm, I could be either or. Same, go to the gospel, go to Jesus, ask God for that faith. And then lastly, if you're, you're like, yeah, I'm a believer, um, great. I want you to be confident in that, but still look at your life. See if there's anything in your life that right now is not in accordance with the gospel and not in accordance with God's word. And repent. Go to God. He loves you. Um, Christian, he loves you. Person who doubts and he loves you. Person who thinks I might not be a believer. So uh, I'm going to pray. That's it. I'm going to pray if you want prayer. Dominique and I will be in the back accepting prayer requests for on-the-spot prayer requests for anything regarding to this passage or anything you want, really. So I'll pray. Jesus, um, thank you for your word, and thank you that uh, you love us enough to call out these things. Thank you that your answer to this is not to try harder or to do better because we would fail every time, um, but that it's Jesus and he already tried harder and did perfectly for us and he took our punishment. Um, I pray for believers in here, anyone who's doubting themselves or anyone who is just not a believer, God, that every single one of them go to you and your gospel. Amen.